Hi, my name is Joe, and I'm one of the pastors at Redeemer Lincoln Square. Now, let me read for you today's passage, which comes from Deuteronomy chapter 21, uh, verses 10 to 14. When you go out to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God gives them into your hand, and you take them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you desire to take her to be your wife, and you bring her home to your house, she shall shave her head and pare her nails. And she shall take off the clothes in which she was captured, and shall remain in your house and lament her father and her mother a full month. After that you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. But if you go no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants. But you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave, since you have humiliated her. Amen. Now here we have a law uh, that seems very harsh. There's talks of war and prisoners of war taking a a woman captive and bringing her in uh, as your wife and all those things. And and from our modern perspective, when we look back at it, it sounds uh, offensive almost uh, at first glance. But you know, if we were to look closer Uh, not just to this particular law in our passage today, but to all the other laws that we find in Deuteronomy, what we would find is that this law is actually a good example uh, of the objectives and the priorities of the Old Testament laws as a whole. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, of course, we'd like to live in a world without wars and prisoners of war. Um... And quite frankly, the questions that we have about uh, the setting and the context of this passage may as well apply to us today, right? If there is a good God, uh, why does suffering exist, right? Why does he seem to operate within the reality of wars, uh, poverty, racism, sickness, disease, and death? Right, And that is a really important question to ask and one that I quite frankly don't have all the answers for, but I would certainly love to process with you, by the way. And if you have any questions and if you'd like to process uh, this topic of suffering and why God allows suffering or anything else, uh, please feel free to email us at lsq at redeemer.com. We'd love to continue uh, to process with you. Uh, But for the purposes of our passage today, uh, what we find in biblical history is that God operates within the bounds of the existence of suffering, existence of violence. And in our passage, we see that he operates within the existence of wars and the prisoners of war. And our passage today recognizes that reality And as so many other laws in the Old Testament does, looks to mitigate the worst effects of sin, mitigates the worst effects of the violence and the suffering that exists within our society. Now, how does it do that? Well, let's look at this passage here because we need to ask the question, right? Whose interests does this law serve? It's clearly the female captive whose interests are served by this law. Now, on the flip side of it, whose power is being restricted? Right? The answer, of course, is the soldier on the victorious side whose power is being restricted. Right? He cannot do whatever he wants with the female captive that he took on. Right? And this is a pattern that we're going to see over and over again throughout Deuteronomy. Right? These Old Testament laws that look to lift up the interests of those who are in the margins, those who are powerless, those who have been defeated in battle, and restricting the power and the privilege of those who are in positions that could wield them to their advantage. Right? To do with... Uh, the poor and the powerless, uh, what they like with them. And so just as an example, right, from this text even, we see uh, four things. The first thing that we see is that the woman who is captured is not to be taken advantage of or enslaved as a concubine, just on the side, uh, but need to be given the full status of the wife, right? There's no sense that we get in this passage that the soldier that looks to take this woman uh, is given a free pass right, at violating the seventh commandment, right? 
uh, part of the Ten Commandments that was given earlier, uh, to not commit adultery. Now, he's still bound within that commandment. So that means if the soldier was to take this female captive to be his wife, uh, he needs to stay committed to her, right? He is to have this, just this one wife. Um, so that's the first thing. But the second thing is the woman is to be given time, right, to adjust to her new to situation, right, to be given time to properly mourn, uh, not in some prisoner's camp, uh, but in the safety and security of her new home, right? That's what all the talk about shaving her head and paring her nails and uh, uh, mourning for her father and mother. That's what all that is about, right? To be given time to mourn, to be given time to adjust to her new reality. And the third thing that we see is that it's an important uh, one to point out that the marriage bed is not to be consummated before her time of mourning is over so that she's really given the time uh, that she needs. Right? This is an, uh, an instance where the soldier on the Victoria side uh, can just take advantage of this female captive in any way that he likes uh, sexually. And fourth and the last thing is, and in the event that the man changes his mind for some reason and no longer, uh, it becomes no longer willing to love her and to cherish her as his wife, he is prohibited from just keeping her around or selling her off as a slave uh, to profit off of her. Rather, he is to set her free so that she can go to the place that she chooses and to live the life that she chooses uh, to live. And so what we see here is that the captive woman's welfare is the focus of this law, and not the desires and the, the claims of the man, the soldier on the victorious side. Now, having said all that, what does this mean for us? Well, it means for us when biblical Christians talk about human rights. It has nothing to do with uh, their positions of power, Right, whether they have uh, or their place in society, but it has everything to do with God's concern for every single individual who bears his image. But further, as we have seen from this text, his special concern uh, is reserved for those who are powerless, those who are poor, and those who are in the margins. Right, just to close this out, let me read this passage it's from the New Testament, uh, from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 uh, to 55. And it's a song that uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, sings, right, prompted by the Holy Spirit, and gives us a window into the priorities of God. So let me close our time uh, by reading this passage. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has grown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Amen.